Um, hello, so thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Callie. I'm HR and Facilities Manager at Payday Studios. Um, we haven't got a huge amount of time today, so um, I will do a very brief introduction to, to who Payload is, just in case anyone anyone uh, doesn't know who we are. So uh, we were formed in 2013 and we are an award-winning independent game studio based in London, um, usually in Farringdon, but obviously at the moment we're all working remotely. Um, we're, we're up to 31 people now. We grew a little bit last year. We expect to grow a little bit more this year as well. Uh, we are makers of TerraTech, which is a sandbox adventure game and we also operate the tentacle zone which is a network of independent developers uh, encompassing uh, the, a co-working space which is which is in our office um, lots of events and also a digital incubator specifically for early stage founders from underrepresented groups which i will speak about in a bit um, obviously for us uh, 2020 to 2021 offered some some uh, new and unprecedented challenges uh, you know I think all of us were dealing with a lot of things which which we weren't uh, necessarily expecting to have to be dealing with um, for us it was it was a pretty dramatic change we weren't a remote working studio before the pandemic um, and, and it wasn't really something that we did we did a lot of so definitely a period of adjustment um, but we've we've done a lot to to support our team which is why I'm here today um, so just a quick introduction to me, um, as I said, I'm Kali, um, I am HR and facilities manager, which means that I head up everything to do with people operations. So from recruitment and training, so to wellbeing, uh, benefits and kind of everything, everything in between. Um, in 2019, I also launched our inclusion and diversity initiative, which is a bit of a, a passion, uh, passion of mine, I suppose. Um, and I also organize and, and host our regular inclusion focused game on events, uh, which are open to the wider industry. Uh, in addition to that, I also manage the office and buildings for payload and our tentacle zone residents. So uh, there's a lot to, to keep me and my team busy. Um, so today I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, how we've supported our team over the last year or so. It's very kind of high level um, because I think all of these things that, that I'm going to speak about, I could probably give it a talk about um, just uh, in isolation. So, so yeah, it's, it's going to be brief, but hopefully uh, it will be helpful. Um, and what I'm not going to cover is kind of the practicalities. I think all of the things that we'll probably have already all done, we've all thought about in terms of sending, you know, our team's equipment, in terms of sharing best practice for working from home, you know, uh, amendments to or changes to, commun you know, communication. Um, so, so I'm just going to assume that, that most people have, have already done all of that stuff uh, and instead I'm going to share some of the other things that, that um, you know, we've done that we've found um, really useful. So to begin with, uh, I'll just talk a little bit about connection and engagement. Um, this was I mean, it's important to everyone, but particularly uh, for us, we have a very kind of social studio at lunch times, uh, you know, our, our kitchen and cafe area would be kind of a hub of activity. You'd go down, people would be playing magic or board games or having clubs or playing table football or just having a chat, talking about, you know, the latest, uh, you know, Netflix series or whatever it might be. Um, and so we, we really wanted to kind of retain that, um, retain the social aspect. And make sure that people weren't feeling isolated, uh, you know, or working from home, um, particularly those who are, who are living by themselves or maybe don't have, you know, a support network socially. Um, so we tried a lot of different things um, and some, some things work better than others. Um, the first thing I think we tried to do is replicate what we had in the office. So we thought, right, lunchtime is, is the key time that people socialize, it's the key time that they run you know, staff clubs and play games. Let's try and replicate that virtually. Um, so we had a kind of drop in Google Meet session, you know, people come along, have a, have a social chat. But what we found is that just didn't work. Um, and I think it was a combination of, you know, working from home brings additional responsibilities. So whether it's, you know, getting kids, uh, uh, lunch or whether it's okay getting ahead with putting some washing in or just taking a break and, and going for a walk around, around the block. What we found is that people actually wanted a break from their screens at lunchtime and they didn't want to come and, and kind of jump into a, to a social call, even if it's for kind of a, a fun chat with your colleagues. Um, so, so we kind of had to think outside the box on that one. Um, one of the things that we did, which has worked really well for us, is introduced a coffee break club. So essentially it's an uh, optional club uh, and everyone who, who kind of opts in is assigned a small group um, to arrange a social chat with. So it's usually two or three people um, and you just arrange a chat during work time over a cup of tea and coffee to, to have a chat. Um, and it's been really good, I think, to kind of um, retain some of that connection and some of that uh, socialising, but also particularly for our new starters 
um, it's been really good for them to get to know people and to chat to people outside of their teams. Um, and I know even I found it, even I've found it helpful. Um, you know, I've been at Payload for a couple of years, so I, I know most people, but it's been a really nice kind of um, uh, kind of opportunity, I suppose, or reason to, to speak to people outside of the teams that you usually work with. Um, so, so that's been a big success for us. Um, Something we did recently, which I actually nabbed from another studio, so I can't take uh, I can't take credit for this idea, is to set up a feel good factor channel in um, in Slack. So the idea uh, behind that is basically just to kind of facilitate people to share kind of photos or articles that just bring a bit of positivity. So whether it's you know uh, the latest pictures of, of their kids are doing something cute, or or you know latest pets things you're growing in the garden, things people see on their daily walks, uh, you know, sunny, sunny sky, articles about good news, whatever it might be, just kind of to have this stream of positivity so that if people do need a break from Twitter or from BBC News or whatever else they might be reading, they've got somewhere that they can go and kind of see some stuff to hopefully give them a bit of a, a mood boost. Um, and it's early days for us for that. We're, we've only had it kind of uh, up and running for a couple of weeks, but it seems to be off to a good start. Um, so, so yeah, something, something to think about. Um, I also wanted to just touch quickly on gifts and hampers because this was a little bit of a uh, frustration point for me early in the pandemic because I think, uh, you know, a lot of people thought along the same lines of, okay, can we send a care package, can we send, send a, a hamper to our to our staff, um, and what I found is that a lot of the, the companies that offered some really cool things had mem minimum orders that were far above, you know, our team sizes, so it would be minimum order of 50 or, you know, you could only um, get this, that and the other if, if you were under, under um, 100 or whatever it might be, so it was actually quite difficult to find something that was, that was kind of cost effective and um, and looked good and, and, and would help our team. Um, but I will say that, so for Halloween, we just decided to send everyone um, a, just a, a, a box of chocolates, basically, you know, pretty, pretty, you know, basic box of chocolates. But um, I've never had such positive feedback. <laughs> and I've done, I like to think, uh, you know, I've done a lot of really great things uh, being at Payload and we've made a lot of really positive changes um, within the studio. But the one thing that they got the most kind of uh, love, if you like, is, is sending people a surprise box of chocolates. And for me, you know, that was quite unexpected. Um, but I think it just demonstrated that, that people really appreciate the gesture and just showing showing people that you're thinking about them and, and that the company cares about them is is um a, you know a really valuable thing to 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 be doing um and I, and I am also um pleased to say that eventually we did find some people that that could sell <laughs> send hampers you know in smaller in smaller sizes but it was a bit of a, a bit tricky to begin with um I was going to do a whole section on kind of training and, and personal development but just because of time I kind of cut that section um but I did just want to mention that the shift towards remote working and, and kind of offering things remotely has actually, we've found it's opened up new possibilities for training. So the cost of a lot of these sessions have gone down and it's also the accessibility. Uh, you know, it's easier to kind of attend a half day training course if you don't have to spend the time traveling to, to a new location and back again, etc. Um, and uh, a tip that, that might be useful is that we've done some, some training courses um, such as line management training for some of our line managers who hadn't you know, been formally trained in that area before um, through ACAS uh, and we've found that, that they've been really good, um, very professional, very helpful and also um, enable you to kind of tailor the sessions. So even if you only have a few people attending, um, you still kind of get a session that, um, that meets your needs and, and your requirements and you're able to, to kind of tailor that, which is really useful. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to mention in this section was around feedback so I think you know we're probably all aware that that feedback is, is key you know getting feedback from from our teams is, is really important and, and that's certainly been the case for this last year with, with everything going on um, so some things that we've, we've done is just uh, reiterating the, the channels for reporting any problems or, or issues and making sure that there are multiple channels so that if people aren't comfortable going to their line manager or they're not com comfortable coming to me as HR they've got other places to go and they're clear on those processes um, so that you know we hope that there, there aren't any issues but if there, if there is then they know where they, they can go to, to kind of talk about them. Um, and the other thing is obviously just listening to, to the feedback um, that you get from your teams. We have um, made sure that there is uh, multiple channels again for providing feedback to the company, including an, anon an, an anonymous form on, on, um, that we've set up, uh, you know, using Google Forms. And um, we hope that, that you know, people don't, don't feel the need to, to um, 
uh, you know, kind of do that. And, and in an ideal world, everyone would feel comfortable providing uh, feedback in, in a very kind of constructive and, and open forum. But we also know that different people have different preferences when it comes to communicating and particularly when kind of raising any issues. Um, so we just added that in. Uh, um, uh, not specifically because of the pandemic or anything it's something that kind of predated that but it's been it's been really useful to to get feedback from people and to get questions that we can then address in meetings um mental health and well-being so i will um quickly go through this uh, I, I mean some of the previous speakers kind of highlighted why it's important um so i'm sure that we're all, all aware that this past year in particular it, it's been really important to make sure that we're supporting our our teams in this area um, this was something that was already a priority for us, but um, we, we've managed to add more support. Um, we had mental health first aiders um, pre-existing um, to, to the pandemic. And if anyone doesn't, um, I, I would really recommend that because um, they are they have been really useful for us. And, and um, you know, I'm, I'm trained and a couple of the other team are trained and I've had people approach me that I, I you know, would never have known was struggling if it wasn't for the fact that we had these, these kind of appointed people that, that um, the team can come and speak to. Having said that, um, a lot of a lot of uh, being a mental health first aider is about seeing signs, you know, changes in behaviour, changes in mood, um, and obviously people are less visible when we're working remotely. So we've tried to kind of ensure that there are regular check-ins, as I think one of the previous speakers was talking about. Um, and, and, you know, it goes beyond kind of one-to-ones just to talk about work. It's, you know, dedicated places for people to talk about how they're doing. Um, and that's, that's, I think, really important, particularly um, as we move into kind of a hybrid model or a remote working model, whatever the, the new normal looks like, it's likely that it will involve more working remotely and it might be harder to spot these signs. So that's something that we've been thinking about. Um, in addition to that, we've signed up for an employee assistance program, which is a, essentially a help and advice um, phone line run by an external company um, that anyone from, from the studio can call 24 hours um, a day, 365 days a year. Um, and there's also limited counselling provided with that. So everyone has access to six sessions uh, um, a year, which, you know, is not as, as maybe as, as expansive as, as we'd like, but I, I feel like it's a really good start. Um, it's, it's proven very useful so far. Um, and I think it's good also to have someone outside of the company that, that your team can talk to, um, because if it is something to do with work stress or something like that, uh, you know, they, they may want to speak to someone outside of, you know, their immediate team. Um, and it also covers, um, you know, mental health, um, stress and anxiety, etc. But it also covers things like financial advice and, and, and that side of things as well. Um, so it's relatively low cost and, and you only pay for the employees that you have. Um, so some of the other solutions we looked at, um, you know, weren't as accessible for, for smaller teams. So I think an EAP is, is a good place to start. Um, other stuff that we have done, um, we have started a wellbeing Slack channel, which uh, was an idea. Again, I, I now have a different studio. Um, I um, it, it's basically to facilitate peer to peer support and and and, and um, sharing of kind of tips and resources. I was a little bit dubious as to how well it would work for us because we do have a smaller team, which means, you know, you'll have less people engaging than, than a company that has hundreds and hundreds of people. But actually it's, it's been really useful as well. Oh, sorry, just skipping ahead there. Um, we have also, so yes, so something that's been really important to us is, is just trying to create an ongoing dialogue and conversation about mental health and creating that culture where, it, where you can talk about it, where people don't feel like they have to deal with it by themselves and where people understand that it's something that will impact all of us, uh, likely impact all of us uh, at some point. Um, so that includes hosting events and chats around mental health, including some senior members of staff kind of sharing their experiences and, and their challenges, which has been, um, you know, that, that was a really powerful experience. Um, and just creating that safe space as well. So using Chatham House um, rules, et cetera, just to make sure that, that people are comfortable um, sharing and there's a, there's a space for them to do so. Um, so my key takeaways from, from kind of the last year is that there are lots of low cost options um, for supporting your team's um, mental health and well-being. And there's certainly more that we should be doing and there's certainly more that we will be doing. Um, but, but uh, you know, the things listed kind of on this slide, I think, are, are a good start. So uh, anyone who knows me knows that, um, you know, you wouldn't get away with, with me giving any kind of talk without there at least being some discussion of uh, uh, diversity, equity and, and inclusion. And today is no different. So um, just before I wrap up, um, I wanted to kind of just um, share a few bits uh, from the last year from our perspective on, on EDI. Um, so 
one of my priorities, one of the studio's priorities was to ensure that we continue to make progress um, on, on inclusion, um, equity and, and diversity, it, even though there was all these challenges happening with the pandemic and everything else, um, and a lot of business, you know, how the business run and everything else, uh, we really wanted to ensure that we, we continue to make progress and, and positive change. So our approach um, is, is just to try and, and build inclusion into everything that we do and make sure that it's a, it's a, it's a thread running through everything. Um, so for our Game On events, which, which have been running since uh, 2019, um, having them in an online setting actually opened up a whole new audience for us, um, which, which was fantastic. Um, I think sometimes the games industry can be sometimes uh, quite London centric. So to be able to hold online events and see people join and not just um, as attendees, but also speakers from around the country and, and in some cases even internationally, um, you know, that's been that's been really great. Um, we haven't had the event quite at the, at the frequency that, that we'd like, um, uh, but but we've, we've made some really positive steps on that, which which I'm really happy with. Um, we've also continued to kind of assess our internal policies and, and benefits, and we've made some really uh, kind of significant and positive changes on, on that front in the last year, which which I'm really proud of. Um, and that includes, uh, you know, um, setting up and, and developing uh, an inclusion working group, um, also known as ERG and, and various other, <laughs> other names, I think. Um, and, and one thing that, that was a struggle for, for me um, when I was thinking about this was we are not at the size where, where we can have lots of individual groups. So you'll hear, um, I think AWS were talking about it earlier, but, but you know, a lot of the bigger companies that they will have specific groups for women or specific groups for people of color or other underrepresented groups. And we're just not big enough for that yet. Um, uh, you know, we, we just don't have, have the team size for it. And also uh, to be quite honest, we don't have necessarily the representation or the diversity in, in all the areas that we would we would like in the studio. Um, so our solution for now is to was to create an uh, inclusion working group. And it's been such a fantastic, um, you know, it's been such a fantastic experience, um, you know, getting people involved in that and, and really seeing changes happen within the studio that have come as a direct result of conversations and, and sharing um, that has happened within that working group. Um, so, so I think even with small teams, there's always an opportunity to kind of create a space where people feel, um, you know, empowered and comfortable sharing ideas and, and sharing, you know, issues that they might have noticed or, or areas that they feel needs changing. And, and that's been a, a really positive thing for us. Um, and finally, I just wanted to um, kind of, uh, I guess, point out that we have leveraged our, our learnings from, from Game On um, and also all of the remote events that were run on the tentacle zone side of things to launch a digital um, incubator specifically for underrepresented groups. So this is something that, that may not have come about if it wasn't for the remote working situation, if it wasn't for us kind of having to, to pivot our events online. Um, and I mean, it may have been something that, that we ended up doing eventually, uh, but I, I think it's been, you know, really, um, I guess one of the silver linings of, of the last year is that we've been able to get this, uh, you know, get this off the ground and it's launched and, and participants are taking part. Um, and I'm really kind of proud of the, of the studio um, for supporting that and for, for the team, um, my colleague Nisha and the rest of the team for kind of making that happen. Um, and, and yeah, it, I just think it's really great. So I thought I would mention it. Um, and yeah, so that last point is basically what I just said. Um, so I think I'm on I'm, I'm pretty much uh, out of time now. So I will quickly go through my key learnings um, that, that I, uh, you know, that summarize kind of what I've, I've spoken about. So um, the changing work landscapes, you know, called for kind of new and enhanced ways to support our teams. And, and uh, you know, we needed to rethink a, a few things, uh, but that's that's fine. There's always a solution. A small gesture uh, can mean a lot, as in the case of, of the box of chocolates. Um, and I think it's really important to listen to your teams. I'm, I'm sure um, most people agree, um, but it's also really important to remember that everyone is different. So remote working, I think, is, is a great example of that. You know, a lot of people really liked it. A lot of people um, uh, 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 flourishing, uh, you know, during the remote working period, but that's not the case for everyone. And, and there's no right way to feel, you know, everyone is entitled um, to feel the way that they do. And it's important to remember that there are always going to be, you know, differences um, because everyone's an, an, an individual. Um, 
and yeah, so improvements in enhanced support, they don't have to be costly. You know, there's lots of things that, that you can look at um, that, that don't cost any money at all. Um, and for a small, if you're a small or, or medium sized studio or organization, um, you know, you may need to take a different approach to larger companies, but that doesn't mean that, that you can't achieve, uh, you know, as much as, as, as larger companies with, with, you know, more staff and more resources. You've just got to find what works for your team. Um, and that is me. 